we're going to carry on if we stopped on uh, uh, Wednesday. On Wednesday, we had covered just the four verses, the first four verses of Ephesians chapter 1. And we closed with verse 4, with a very powerful verse, which says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And we spoke at length about what it means uh, to be holy and blameless in his sight. We'll go on from verse 5, and we'll go slowly, uh, verse by verse. And I'm going to read from verse 5, and uh, we'll maybe take sometimes two or three verses at a time. Second part of verse uh, 4, or verse 5, 4 writes, In love, that is fourth verse, second part, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of pleasure and will. In accordance with his pleasure and will. He, he predestined. Now the word predestination is a very confusing word for many people. And uh, the Greek word for predestination is pro pro-osthesas. Oh, what is that? pro orisas pro orisas basically means earmarked or set apart for. Earmarked, set apart for. And God predestines those whom he foreknew. The word for foreknowledge is pro ergo. That's found in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29. All those people whom he foreknew will respond to the gospel he predestined, set apart, earmarked to be adopted as his sons, according to his pleasure and his will. Now, the only begotten son of God is Christ. The only begotten son. In this world where he walked, he's always been God, Christ. He's Emmanuel, God with us. When he entered the world, a body of flesh and blood was prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary for the Christ to come and live. He was not born of a union of man and woman. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and created a body in the womb of the Mary because the Holy Spirit is the creator. Psalm 104 verse 30 says, when God sends forth the Spirit, they are created. So in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit created a body of flesh and blood in which body the Christ, the Messiah, came and lived. And when he entered the world, he was given the name Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua Ha Messiah, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. And all of us are adopted as his children. When we're following the ways of the world, we're actually following the devil. In fact, at one point of time, when the Lord told the Jews, they always thought they're the only children of God. And the Lord uh, uh, told them in John 8.32, you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. And they say, we're Abraham descendants, we've never been slaves of anybody. We're Abraham descendants. And the Lord says, I know you're Abraham descendants. Then they say, Abraham is our father. The only father we have is God himself. This is what they say in John 8, 41. And Jesus responds by saying, rather when they said they're Abraham descendants, he says, I know you are Abraham descendants. When they say Abraham is our father, verse 39, the only father we have is God himself. John 8, 41. The Lord responds by saying, verse 44, John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil. What a strong statement. You belong to your father, the devil. When we're following the world, Jews or Gentiles, we're actually following the evil one. Having come to believe in Christ, we have now become the children of God. Adopted as his children. In John chapter 1, 10, 11, 12, we read, John writes about Jesus. John chapter 1, 10, 11, 12. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. His own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, 
who believe his name, God gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, or husband's will, but born of God. We are adopted as his children. And that's the pleasure and will of God. Will means wish or desire, telma. And God finds pleasure in drawing all people to, he wants all people to be saved. This predestination is very confusing for many Christians because they think only some people are predestined for salvation. Everyone who has chosen to believe in Jesus is predestined for salvation. Predestination, predestination is not, uh, you know, earmarked only for some people. It's for everybody, but all those who accept Christ are earmarked. It's available for everybody. Salvation is a gift for every human being in the world. Only when we receive the gift, we become children of God, we become saved, and we can enjoy not only the promise of eternal life, but we choose to live for the Lord in this world, we will manifest abundant life. Okay, let's go on. It says, with the pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. The one he loves is Christ, and through Christ he has freely given us this amazing gift, this indescribable gift. And Paul goes on to uh, emphasize on this grace of God. And verse 7 he says, in him, meaning in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. The key is the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ, all our sins are cleansed. This forgiveness in Christ was spoken of in the Old Testament by every prophet. Every prophet testifies. It's all concealed in different parts of the scriptures. The law testifies to the Messiah, John 5.39, and the prophets testify about Messiah. When Peter spoke to the household of Cornelius in Acts 10 43, it's written, he says to them, All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. So, all those who believe in him are predestined as adopted, adopted as sons, predestined. To conform, conform to the image of Jesus. Look at, we compare this with Romans chapter 8, 29 30. It says, Those whom he foreknew, to his foreknowledge, he sees the hearts of people, he predestined to conform to the image of his son, to be like Jesus. That's his earmark for that. We are earmarked for that, set apart for that. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those he may call, he justified. Those who may justify, he glorified. So all of us in the world can choose to receive this gift of salvation. Gift for everybody in this world. But God sees the hearts and his foreknowledge. He'll ensure we hear the, get to hear the gospel. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Let me go on. So the blood by the blood of Christ, by the sprinkling of the blood by faith, by sprinkled blood, our hearts are cleansed from a guilty conscience. There's no guilt for a Christian. Every sin in the spirit has been cleansed by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Hebrews 10, 14 says, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Once and for all by the blood, all those who believe in this sacrifice have been cleansed of sin and we have the assurance of salvation. That's the pleasure of God, the will of God. And uh, talking about pleasing God, in Corinthians chapter 1, 1920, Paul writes, For God was pleased to have all this fullness dwell in Jesus. 
dwell in him, in meaning in Jesus. And through him, again here it says through him, he reconciled to himself all things, whether things on heaven, in heaven or on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Peace means oneness. In Greek, irene, oneness. And he has reconciled us to himself through the blood of Christ. That's why we always, every day, must remember the cross. Without the cross, it will be nowhere. Without the blood, it will be nowhere. And that's why I think the only ritual ordained and prescribed in the New Testament is communion. Parting with the bread and wine, symbolic of the body and blood of Christ. As often as we do it, we remember his death, we proclaim his death till he comes again. His death means salvation. It means wisdom, power, all the blessings that God wants to give us come to us through Christ. So through faith in his blood, we are saved. We have no guilt. We are of every sin and we are made perfect. And it goes on to say, uh, through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He lavished his grace upon us. In fact, uh, even to be called the child of God is the lavishness of God's love. The Apostle John, who was supposedly very close to Jesus among all the disciples, when he understood by revelation what it meant to be a child of God. The amazing significance of being a child of God. In 1 John chapter 3 from verse 1 he writes, 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That's what we are. We are the children of God. Our Heavenly Father, we are adopted as children, and he is a heavenly father. And that's a lavishness of God's love. We don't deserve it. Grace is something we get we don't deserve. And therefore, Paul is full of glorying, glorifying Christ in the context of salvation, in the context of work of Christ on the cross for each one of us. Lavish on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 9. And he, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. The mystery of his will. This mystery, the Greek word for mystery is mysterion. M-Y-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. Mystery. It basically means mystery only. And the word, the mystery here is not defined what mystery is talking about. But very interestingly, to the church in Colossae, Paul elaborated about this mystery. Two aspects of this mystery. By the way, Colosse was only 160 kilometers away from Ephesus. They were all very close to each other. The seven churches of Revelation are all very close to each other. And Colosse was only 160 kilometers east of Ephesus. So they always had interaction between them. And uh, the church in Colosse was probably formed by Epaphras, who was one among the people in, in Ephesus in the Bible study. And therefore, there are a lot of interaction between these churches. To the Colossians, Paul elaborated about this mystery. Two aspects of this mystery. Mystery of Christ. Number one, Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, hope of glory. It's a mystery. Mystery. Christ in you, hope of glory. It's an amazing mystery. Just because Christ lives in us, we have the hope of glory. We are saved. We are earmarked for heaven. It's a mysterious thing. Just by accepting my Savior and Lord, repenting and accepting Him, His Spirit comes and dwells in us, we see later on verse 14, as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The first aspect of mystery mentioned here and expanded in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, hope of glory. If Christ is not in us, we have no hope of glory. And the word Christian means belongs to Christ. Everybody who has Christ in him or her belongs to Christ. 
We don't have Christ in you. We don't belong to Christ. So the word Christian basically means belongs to him. Who is a Christian? Someone who has the spirit of Christ in him or her. This is why the Apostle Paul put a question to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 13 chapter, verse 5 and 6. A question as to, are you Christians? How do you know you're Christian? He writes in these two verses, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself. Don't you realize Christ Jesus lives in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust you discover we have not failed the test. The test is, is Christ living in you? Today, there are a lot of doubts about who is a Christian who is not a Christian. When do you become a Christian? How do you know you are a Christian? Very simple. Is Christ in you? This is a question the Apostle Paul put to the church in Corinth. Is Christ in you? Christ in us? Hope of glory. No Christ in us, no hope of glory. That's the first mystery. Second mystery is again written to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. The mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The first aspect of this mystery of mysterion is Christ in you, hope of glory. Anybody who has Christ in him or her, Jew or Gentile, has the hope of glory, assurance of salvation. And every such person will realize it's a mystery that when you are in Christ and you abide in him, in him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So everybody in Christ has access to God's wisdom the knowledge of God, a knowledge of scriptures. God loves to reveal to us his scriptures. It's a mystery. And therefore, let's thank God for the mystery revealed to us. So it's no more a mystery for us to reveal to us. Before Christ came to the big mystery, how Gentiles can be also saved. But then that is answered in the second chapter of Acts onwards. When the people came there, Jews came there, and thereafter we find uh, the, the gospel went to the Gentiles in Antioch. 11th chapter, all disciples were called Christians in Antioch. And therefore, let's understand that this mystery that Christ in us is the hope of glory and in him our treasure of wisdom and knowledge is revealed to us today and we can enjoy the benefit of this amazing promise of God. Okay, then it goes on to say, Mr. will call this good pleasure, which is purpose in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. For a Jew, it's mysterious as to how a Gentile can be a child of God. Christ in you, hope of glory. And Christ in us only because we received him and we then become children of God. At the right time, he'll bring all things under one head when everyone turns to Christ. In fact, it says in the Bible that the Jews one day will all turn to Christ. One of the signs of the second coming of Christ is all Israel will be saved. Romans 11, 26. All Israel will be saved. When the times have come to its fulfillment. Now the word times here is Chiron. That, but the word time has two meanings in Greek. Chronos, meaning period of time. Kairos, specific time. Here it says, when the times have reached the fulfillment, Chiron. When Christ comes the second time, then ultimately all of God's promises will be fulfilled. We'll all be in heaven together with him forever and ever. From every tribe and language and people and nation, all under one head is Christ. And for a Jew, it's very mysterious as to how even Gentiles can be saved. And Peter had to explain to the Jews how when he spoke in the household of Cornelius, that the Holy Spirit came upon the household of Cornelius also. And God accepted them by faith. Praise God for the amazing grace. 
and thank God for mystery revealed to us today and we can enjoy this promises that God has given us. Verse 11. In him, meaning in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. The word will means wish or desire. The will of God is all people are saved. Again, I'm coming back to predestination. His desire is everybody is saved. But all those who be foreign, he predestined. How do you know he wants all people to be saved? First Timothy 2 4. He wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3 9. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's the will of God. But then some people will not do his will. His will is everybody is saved, but everybody will not be saved. Because some will choose to love wickedness rather than the gift of salvation. It seems very, very difficult to believe, but there are people who reject this salvation. In John 3, 19, Jesus said, John 3, 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into darkness. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. People prefer to live in sin in this world for a temporary period rather than enjoy salvation for eternity. That's the hardness of man's heart. But praise God and thank God that in His grace, he revealed himself to us. We are saved. And therefore, we have to create awareness of this amazing gift of salvation to people whom God takes us to. And people come to us as led by the Lord. Verse 12. In order that we were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Having saved us, he wants us to be a people who constantly glorify him and praise him. In fact, the reason why God created man was for this praise and for his glory. People ask this question, why are they created? Why did God create man? What's the purpose of our creation? We all die after some certain number of years, we go to heaven. What's the meaning of life? It's very clearly mentioned in the book of Isaiah. 43rd chapter, verse 7 and verse 21. Two verses explain why God created man. Isaiah 47 says, He created us for His glory. He created man for His glory. Verse 21, He created man for His praises. His glory and His praise. Now, people of this world don't know that. They cut off from God. That's why they have this question. Why am I created? Why, why am I living in this world? I don't understand the purpose of my creation. They don't know God. How can they know the purpose of creation? Today, you and me have come to know the Lord. And according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Colossians 3, 10, we are being renewed in the image of the Creator. We are being renewed in wisdom and knowledge, in the image of the Creator. Therefore, today we understand we are called to glorify Him, the original purpose of creation of man, to glorify God and praise Him. Today we have a reason to praise Him and glorify Him because we are saved. We have become children of God. We have the assurance of eternal life and the promise of abundant life as we choose to live in this world. So today, there's a reason for us to praise. We know why we should praise God, who he is and who we are in him, and to glorify him. Now, let me uh, explain the difference between exalting, glorifying, and praising. This question once came up in the Q&A sessions in the evening meetings. Difference between glorifying, praising, and exalting. To praise him, you should speak well of him. To speak well of God, not to complain about Him or grumble against God. To speak well of God is to praise Him. 
to, to glorify him is to give credit to him. Give him credit. So for, for salvation, we give credit to God, obviously. And we praise him, we speak well of him because of what done for us. What is exalting? Exalting is to lift up the law, to lift up Jesus. Exalting is lifting up. Praising is speaking well of. Glorifying is giving God the credit. Let's go back. For the praise of his glory. Be my be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13. These two are very important verses. I'll do it uh, in detail on uh, Monday. I start with the 13th verse. I'll just mention it now and a little bit explain. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, the word salvation has got at least two meanings in the Greek. Sozo, soteria. Soteria is deliverance from sin and death. Sozo, in general terms, is deliverance. Deliverance. Freed. A general term. It can be uh, freedom. It can be saving. Deliverance. Made whole. Sustained. All that part of sozo. Whereas so soteria is specific to deliverance from sin and death. Here, the original Greek, the word here, salvation, is soterias. Soterias. Meaning, having believed, let's go back to the verse. Okay, verse 30. And you who are also included in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, soteria, saving from sin and death, the word of truth came to us, Gospel came to us. When we responded, we included in Christ. We are born again of the imperishable seed of God. When you're born again, you're included in Christ, in the family of God. How are you born again? By the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, Peter writes, For we went born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable seed. Imperishable. To the living and enduring word of God. When you heard the gospel, the word of God, we responded, we got saved, we are born again, and we included in Christ. All those people respond to the gospel positively and receive Christ, Savior and Lord, are saved and saved permanently. And that one we are going to see on Monday, how exciting it is that this salvation is a guarantee of God. Guarantee. That's why I wonder why Christians doubt salvation. It's a guarantee. God has guaranteed to us when we have Christ in our hearts, we are saved. Done. Once and for all. On the cross, he finished it. Soteria, salvation for us. And therefore, it's important for us to know his spirit in our hearts is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in heaven. Simply because we responded to the word of truth, the gospel, which saves us, power of God to save us, and all of us are included in Christ. And once he comes into our hearts, he will never leave us, nor forsake us. He lives in us forever through his spirit. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. May God bless us and let's thank God for the amazing grace and uh, for the praise of his glory. We keep on praising him, glorifying him, lifting up his name. We can never thank God enough for the salvation he has given us. His guaranteed salvation. But remember the word guarantee? We'll come back on, back on, on Monday on this amazing aspect of assurance of salvation. God bless you all.